Hey everyone, welcome to the second and final installment in our Leopard of Rudra Prayag series. We hope you've had as good a time listening to it as Wes had researching it and Jeff and I had hearing it. We just wanted to make a quick intro to explain a little bit about what happens in the second half of this episode. It's the time of year for our Animal March Madness bracket. So we went through the first round of half of the brackets, and we'll finish that up in a subscriber episode that'll be coming hopefully later this week. So that's, uh, again, the every animal is 200 pounds versus each other in a cage match, March Madness. It's maybe far from the most scientific discussion we've ever had, but we had a lot of fun and we can't wait to see what you vote on for the listener results since Jeff's been posting that poll to our Instagram account pretty much every day for the past week or so. So as always, I've been doing too much talking. Let's get to the episode. Let's go. All of our sponsors are for products or services that we've had personal experiences with. Fortunately for us, we haven't had to call my friends at Priority Tax Relief, but these guys are friends of the show and we have actually had people from the show mention tax issues they are dealing with, so we wanted to talk to you a little bit about how they help. So me and Wes met Cody with Priority Tax Relief looking for Kodiak Grizzlies out in Alaska. On our podcast, we talk about predators, and if the IRS is looking for you to pay your back taxes, they will pick up a cent find you, and any assets you have to collect on the debt. The IRS can take away what they want, when they want, to collect on taxes they say you owe. So priority tax relief is kind of like muskox protecting you from wolves. You know, form a circle around you, and they're going to protect you. That's where priority tax can help. They follow the taxpayer bill of rights. When you call Priority Tax, you can speak with a tax professional who can help with protecting your assets and helping resolve the issue altogether. If you're frozen in place because you aren't sure what to do, start with our friends at Priority Tax. Visit PriorityTaxRelief.com or call 888-302-5402 today. A little off script, I have... A personal relationship with Cody, I've actually seen firsthand how much he can help people who have gotten in big trouble with the IRS and back taxes. So please take my word for it. If you owe too much money than you can pay in taxes, please call 888-302-5402 today and they're going to help you out. Welcome back Welcome to Tooth, to and, Tooth and Claw. And Claw. <laughs> so we got Wes Larson, Jeff Larson, and Mike Larson. And we Three are Larson brothers. Finally Tooth part and Claw of the clan. podcast. <laughs> Been um, trying for so long. <laughs> no, Mike Smith, he's great. He's a good guy. We like him. Mike, say hi. Hey. Hi. I messed that up. You gave me really simple instructions and I messed it up. <laughs> you said say hi and I... I blew it. Nah, you're all right. I got a bloody nose just before we started recording, so I might be like a little nasally. I was trying to move stuff again with my mind. Uh, Uh, That'll do it. it. That (laughs) always happens. You know, there's a cost to that, Jeff. Stranger Things makes it look so easy. I just get the bloody nose. I can't move anything though. Yeah. What's her name again? Elephant. Eleven. Eleven. Oh, (laughs) eleven. <laughs> oh man, that's a good uh, joke, right, Jeff? I liked it. It caught me off guard. <laughs> I haven't got a bloody nose in a while. It's probably been mm. at least, probably at least fifteen years. And then I've, I feel like I've gotten hit in the nose pretty hard in those times, but I just haven't gotten a bloody nose. Maybe I don't have any blood. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. it is interesting. Vampire? Huh. Do, do they have? They don't have blood, right? Or do they? They drink think, blood. No, they do. Because remember, like, Dracula will cut his own arm and, like, give it to someone to turn into a vampire. Mm. Right. That's his move. It's his go-to move for <laughs> turning people into <laughs> vampires. Uh, that irascible old man. Yeah. He's a bit of a scoundrel. Well, Dracula. who does it? So you're a zombie, maybe? Zombies don't uh, have blood. Zombies probably just have, like, dried up blood. Yeah. Yeah, that's I'd you. I'd say that's probably it. Well, that's cool. I'm going to kill my cat. No, Whoa. don't. No, we're an animal. <laughs> we're pro-animal here, Wes. 
I'm recording in his room and Toadie. he's like, he'll like come in and like meow at the door. And so I'll, I'll be like, okay, he wants to leave. I'll let him out. And then he just goes outside and meows at the other side of the door. He can't make up his mind. Classic cat. I'm going to murder him. <laughs> Speaking of cats, we're doing part two of our leopard story. Should oh. we just get into oh, it? Oh, wow. Finally. Yeah. yeah, let's go. I don't want to wait a second longer. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you guys are joking. Wes but, told us not uh, to interrupt him much this time because he's yeah. all scattered brained. I'm just turning my mute button on real quick. Also, I got one. I saw one Apple podcast review that said, like, that Jeff guy interrupts Wes too often. So I think I'm done. You're done interrupting, huh? Yeah. The rest of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Just All use right. the, the hand raise function and we'll call on you when it's <laughs> yeah. a good time. <laughs> we'll have a Jeff corner where well, Jeff sometimes is just like, able to interrupt. <laughs> 30 minutes dry. straight. Sometimes un- Wes just gets like dry mouth and is like drinking water and taking a break and I say something, but then Mike cuts it all so it sounds like I'm interrupting him. Yeah, that's because it's always strategy. offensive, Jeff. It's because it's always Whoa. offensive. <laughs> no, dude. Just kidding. So we're going to get into part two of The Leopard of Rudra Prayag. This is a long story. And with these stories, I generally try and pick a good break point for like the different parts of the story. Had I known this one has as much as it does, I might have even made it a three part series because I definitely didn't pick a good halfway break point. I, I should have read a little bit farther in the book. There's a lot to get through today. That's why I sent you guys that text and told you there's a lot to get through. There is. Um, do you know what you should I'm do try- is I like it when people do the so long story short kind of thing and then they just make it really short. <laughs> you should just We're do doing that. a lot of that. We are doing a lot of that. Even okay. with that, there's a lot to get through. Um, the book... The book is really interesting. Again, the book is called The The Leopard of The Man Eating Leopard of Rudra Prayag. It's by Jim Corbett. And it it's really good, but like a lot of these books that are written by these guys in like the late 1800s or early 1900s that are big game hunters, it reads much more like a report than it does a novel. It's not necessarily very poetic usually. And so it is kind of hard to get through. So I am. That's why I'm that, a little scatterbrained. Is he the same guy that wrote Garfield? That's Jim uh, Harrison, right? Or Garrison? What's uh, his last name? I yeah. think it's Harrison. another Jim. It is. A you Jim. Got it. it is Jim. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, that's my one interruption. Yeah. No, yeah, you're that's good. My you one used it. You used <laughs> you it in a really a good, good spot <laughs> there. Yeah. All right. Okay, so where we left off was we had read, I had gone over a number of attacks this leopard had done. We talked about some of the superstitions behind it. We talked a lot about leopard biology. And right as we ended the story, it was right before Jim Corbett showed up on the scene to hunt this leopard. So we're going to go back. We're going to go way back to 1.8 million years ago. Um, wow. An early teenage hominid, one of our ancient relatives, was hunting for food near the entrance of a large cave in what's now South Africa. What this ape-like hominid didn't know was that it also was being hunted. Life on the ground had brought some pretty new advantages and threats for early man, but one of the primary threats was lying in wait in the grass right behind this unaware teenager. The big cat pounced and landed on the back of the shrieking ape, but in a matter of seconds its lower canines found a soft spot and the predator bit down, pushing those large, sharp teeth through the eye sockets of the struggling paranthropus and cracking a skull while the upper teeth crunched through vertebrae. Mercifully, this bipedal early man died instantly. The Mm -hmm. leopard dragged its kill to the nearby cave where it would leave the bones that would be discovered by paleontologists almost two million years later. It would be a reminder of our relationship with one of our oldest monsters in the dark, and that one would still be hunting people in the 1920s in Rudra Prayag. That All same right. one? Not it's like that a same million one. years old. <laughs> the same the same monster in the dark for humans. So this is leopards are an animal that we have a very long evolutionary relationship with. Pretty much as soon as we started coming out of trees and walking on two legs, they started hunting us pretty actively. Mm. And they are one of our oldest predators. There's a very long relationship, and they still sometimes hunt people up to the co- the current day. But we're going to be talking about it's good the to keep we like about. your 
old traditions alive. It is, you know, it's a good relationship, a <laughs> yeah. long lasting yeah. relationship, has its ups and downs. We've definitely done a lot more to them than they have to us. All right. So we're going to go Name over a couple more. we've done to them. Uh, we've killed hundreds of thousands of them. Okay, mm-hmm. fair for their For their coats. Uh, we're going to go over a couple more little vignettes of the terror that this leopard was inflicting on the population. Two brothers, who are both ranchers, were moving 30 buffalo between grazing grounds, and they were accompanied by one of the men's daughters, who was 12. Based on their behavior, it's really likely that these two men that were grazing their buffalo near Rudraprayag hadn't heard about the man-eating leopard, or they were just really overconfident that their buffalo were going to give them some protection because they're being pretty casual about their camping choices. They set up a makeshift cap camp that's surrounded by forest. They tethered their animals in a nearby field, and then they just laid out some blankets on the ground and fell asleep. And... Hmm. from like hearing everyone else talk about how they were living their day-to-day life while this leopard was on the prowl, this is akin to like suicide. Like you're yeah. just asking for it. Laying you're on the camping out tracks. in the open like this. Yeah. yeah. So in the early hours of the morning, it's still completely dark. The men are woken by some anxious booming calls of their buffalo. And they know that these calls are akin to the noises they make when there's a, a carnivore nearby. So they go to investigate, and they leave the 12-year-old girl sleeping on the blanket. Oh, my God. They light a lantern. They walk through their buffalo. They calm them down. They return to their camp. Something's different in their camp when they get back. The little girl is completely gone, and there's a few large splashes of blood on her small blanket. It's too dark to try and follow, follow this trail, the blood trail. But at first light, they go look. They find some blood splashes. They go down a narrow field, down a steep hillside. And they find her remains scattered around some boulders. The crazy thing about this is this leopard had passed them as they were yeah. like calming down their buffalo. It was passing them with one of these guys' daughters in its mouth. Oh, all right. Just another teaching story. them a lesson how to be a better parent, you know, uh, yeah. I guess. live and learn <laughs> a pretty harsh lesson. Okay, so 20 pilgrims are traveling the road near Rudraprayag when they arrive in a small village and they get food and water from a local shopkeeper. The shopkeeper urges them to hurry up and walk the remaining four miles to a pilgrim shelter because it's getting dark and the area around his shop had been frequented by this man-eating leopard. But the pilgrims were really tired and they begged him just to be able to sleep on a large platform that extended from his shop. The shopkeeper's going to be a leopard, I bet. <laughs> They're, They're arguing with the shopkeeper. <laughs> or a leper. Ooh, Ooh that'd be, be either dangerous too. Yeah. A real twist in this story. Uh, <laughs> they're arguing with the shopkeeper when a sadhu arrives, which again is like kind of these really religious kind of kooky monks. And he tells the shopkeeper to let the women from the group sleep inside the shelter and that he would sleep on the platform with the men. And he confidently tells the shopkeeper that he'd protect them from the leopard, and if it showed up, he would take it by the mouth and tear it in half. Wow. It's like those <laughs> yeah. phone book guys. <laughs> the phone yeah, book. Yeah, like Jeff, Jeff with the chimpanzee. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, the strong guys at my middle school ripped the phone I, books. I love the phone book guys. <laughs> I'll never forget the phone book guys. And then he'll shoot a half-court shot with the Dude, leopard's Dude, he made it. <laughs> Amazing. All right. So the shopkeeper finally gives in, he relents, and the sadhu sleeps in the middle of the men on the platform outside. In the morning, the men wake up to find that the sadhu is missing, and not far from where they slept, they found his blanket rumpled up and spotted with blood. When the sun rose, the shopkeeper and the men followed a blood trail across a few terrace fields to a low boundary wall where they found the upper half of the sadhu on top of the wall. His lower half had been completely torn off and consumed. That yeah. so leopards are smarter than we give them credit because it's just it you ripped wait. him in half and he was saying he was gonna rip it in half, rip it in half. <laughs> yeah. And it grabbed the one guy that was like talking all the shit, yeah. Yeah, do you have any theory as to why that because he was sleeping in the middle of the group, right? It's yeah, I there's been multiple times now with this leopard where it grabs a person out of the middle. I don't understand why that is, mm. and like anything I would say would be pure conjecture, but for whatever reason, I grabbed this guy. So Jim Corbett was in a theater 
in his hometown in India, hundreds of miles away, watching an opera when he first heard of the leopard of Rudraprayag. Later that night, a friend of his who was in the local government persuaded him to join Sir William Ibbotson, who is a deputy commissioner in Garwell. Remember him. He's going to come up a lot in our story in this hunt for the leopard. I forgot him. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I> was, <laughs> William was Ibbotson. I'm just going to call him I, Ibbotson. Okay. But I believe Corbett for sure is a he's a like a British national that was born in India. He spent his entire life in India. I think Ibbotson is kind of the same thing. Like these are white British dudes, but they've lived their entire lives in India. This mm-hmm. is when India was still under colonial rule from the UK. I saw a okay. movie about that. RRR. RRR. Yeah. RRR. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's the noise leopards make. RRR. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's leopards in it. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water. It's about water and electrolytes. It makes sense. You lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches, and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Because since the 1940s, when everyone was idiots, we've been told to drink eight glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, but it's to drink water plus electrolytes. Enter Element, or LMNT. You know, if I had just gotten my leg bit off by a scorpion in the desert and I was dying of thirst, and there's an ice-cold glass of water or just a glass of water with Element, I'd go for the Element every time. You're guaranteed to find an Element flavor you love. Try fan-flavored citrus salt, raspberry salt, or get spicy with mango chili or mix chocolate salt into your morning coffee for a mean mocha. Element came up with a fantastic offer just for us. Go to drinkelement.com slash tooth to get a free sample pack with any purchase. So Jim Corbett's already famous for his exploits, hunting other man-eaters like the Champawat tiger, the Pinar leopard, and he is just the guy to call for this sort of thing. So he decides to journey to Rudraprayag. He joins the hunt for the leopard, which at this point, when he joins in 1925, it had already killed about 100 people. In the book, he gives a really good explanation of the terrain around Rudraprayag. We talked about it a little bit, but it's really hilly. Like, if you want to visualize this this story a little bit better, just look up a picture of Rudraprayag. But it's really hilly with steep hills, dense forest, and the Himalayas are like in the background. It's very kind of oh, mountainy, cool. forested area. And it's this mix of tropical and more like alpine forest almost. So wow. there's pine trees, but then there's also like mango trees. Some of the villages in this area are completely surrounded by forests and some are surrounded by fields. And the leopard didn't really have a preference one or the other. Like it would go into either villages that are totally agricultural or ones that are surrounded by forests. There's a ton that happened while Jim Corbett was hunting this leopard, enough to fill a 130-page book. We're not going to go over all of it, but I'm going to give you guys some highlights. Okay? Let's do yeah. it. All right. Top so 10. Not long top 10. It, <laughs> Sports yeah, Center top that. 10. Maybe a little bit more even. <laughs> all right. So not long after he gets to Rudra Prayag, he spends a long night trying to lure the leopard with some goats. And as we mentioned before, this leopard preferred human victims but it would occasionally kill livestock too. So this isn't outside of the realm of like something that's going to work. It will kill goats every once in a while. So he's trying to lure it with goats. Would have been better to like lure him with some little kids or something though. Well, yeah, we're going to get to that. Or so, oh. uh, and it's not going to take long. It kills, while he's trying to catch it with goats, it kills a woman on a hill overlooking a huge valley And he gathers up his supplies and he heads to the village where it happened to get the story. And what the story was, was this woman who was nine months, nine months pregnant Mm -hmm. and her husband had just finished dinner that they ate around this really makeshift fireplace in their home. She had gotten up to wash their pots and pans on the doorstep and her husband decided to light his pipe and take a smoke. He had just lit his pipe when suddenly he hears a clatter of utensils and pots falling to the ground and he looks up to see his wife had disappeared. It's dark out. They knew about the leopard. He calls to her, but he doesn't get a response. So he just runs and locks the door. Oh, Um, oh, man. When he talks to Jim later and Jim Corbett's always kind of like, I don't really blame these people. I kind of blame this guy, to be honest, like Mm. your nine months pregnant wife 
suddenly disappears. You got to run out and try and save her. Um, they thought it was like a demon though. They didn't understand like what a leopard was. Right. Totally. And like, they didn't really understand that enough pressure would cause it to let someone go or, you know, um, in Alabama, that counts as two kills for the leopard. Okay. Uh, Good to know. That's true. Uh, so he explains to Jim that he didn't want to risk his own life and Jim kind of agrees, but he does say it was, this guy was pretty cold and that he seemed a lot more distraught about losing his unborn son than he did his wife. Mm. Um, oh, wow. The leopard dragged this body to a ravine not far away, and that's where they found her remains. And Corbett decides to use her body as bait for this leopard. So he oh. sets up a hide huh. in an oak tree. That kind of speaks to what Jeff was just saying about yeah. using kids or whatever. He ended up using a lot of human victims as bait. Um, sure. I guess that kind of makes sense since that's what it was targeting, but still feels... Yeah, a little grim. Yeah. Yeah. So he hides in a large oak tree, and he sees the paw prints of this leopard. He's confident that it's the leopard that's been killing people. And he knew that this leopard didn't often return to kills, but he was hoping he might get lucky with this woman's remains. It's kind of crazy what he did then. He sets up these bamboo poles, and he ties his gun, his extra gun to these poles and then ties a line to the trigger and runs that line across the path. So if this what? leopard hits <laughs> that line, it's going to be like a rifle booby trap that that hopefully kills it. Oh man, there's no wow. way that works. <laughs> uh, and then he puts a big white rock next to the woman's body. And the reason he does that is because when it gets dark, then he'll have like something that he can still see in the dark to give him an idea of where the leopard and the body are. Mm. So if he hears it like chewing on her, he can just look at the rock, go a few feet to the left and fire and hope he hits the leopard. Hmm. So night sets in and when night sets in, so does a big thunderstorm. Corbett gets really wet and cold waiting for this leopard. And then he realizes the leopard is nearby, but it's also hiding from the rain because he sees it kicking up some grass Um, So he just knows that he's going to have to wait and hope that it finally goes and feeds on the woman. After a few hours, the rain finally lets up and suddenly this white rock is obscured. So he knows that the leopard is standing right in front of the white rock. Wow. And then he could hear the sounds of the leopard feeding, but it's blocking the white rock and he can't really, he doesn't know where to shoot. So he waits and then the the leopard moves. Suddenly he can see the, the rock again, but it's not feeding on the woman. So he waits again and the leopard goes in front of the rock again and he's just kind of doing this back and forth. And then finally the leopard leaves and he can hear it right underneath him in this tree. So he's trying to figure out what to do and he's like, okay, what I'm going to do is just aim my rifle at the rock and if this leopard blocks the rock again, I'll know it's standing there and I'll just shoot. So he raises his rifle and just aims at the rock and is holding his rifle like that for a long time. And like, Jeff, you have a rifle. Are they like super light? No, it's hard. You get you get tired. Yeah. Especially if you're like so, on a tree branch. Right. So he's doing this and his arms are getting super tired. And finally he lets his rifle down. As soon as he does, no. the leopard <laughs> walks in front of this white rock. That's how it works. <laughs> and he says this happens three times before oh, finally God. he's just like <laughs> so frustrated that he just fires a shot and the leopard runs off. Okay, so that's his first real encounter with the man-eater of Rudra Prayag, and it's a frustrating one. Another time, Jim Corbett is camped with his men, and this campsite they pick is just kind of like out in the wilderness, and there's a large tree on the edge of the campsite. So they do kind of what we talked about with the Lions of Savo, where they get all these thorn bushes, and they surround their camp with those thorn bushes. And Corbett knows that the lion or the leopard won't go through these thorn bushes. He's feeling pretty confident about his camp. But the one thing that he's worried about is this tree because the tree is outside of the camp and it overhangs inside of the camp. So they cut a bunch of the low branches from the tree and he's feeling okay about it. And they go to sleep. And as he's sleeping, he starts just visualizing this leopard climbing the tree and jumping into their camp. Sure enough, in the middle of the night, he wakes up to the sound of the leopard climbing the tree and then he hears a large crack and he hears a bunch of people yelling 
And what had happened was his cook was sleeping out on the open ground. And the cook woke up to the leopard's face above it in the tree, like oh, about wow. to pounce on him. Yeah. And they had started to chop down this tree at one point, And the weight of the leopard caused the tree to crack. And it woke the cook up and they all shouted and the leopard ran away. Oh, wow. Um, Man. But before Corbett couldn't get a shot before it was gone. Mm. He didn't set up okay. any more string traps. Did he ever take that first <laughs> one down? That one could be dangerous. <laughs> it's just still. still out there to this day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we got, we got a bunch more here. Um, so Corbett and Ibbotson, his friend, they got another shot at the leopard in a hide and Cor- Corbett was like about to fire and Ibbotson adjusted his weight and the hide creaked and the leopard ran off. Um, <laughs> then the government gave them a gin trap. It's like when trap- you farted and scared that bear, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> when did I do that? Oh yeah. I don't know. Jeff that keeps once. telling me about yeah, it. That's Jeff my, that's my st- version. <laughs> Yeah, oh. it's not true, but I do. I like it. Um, okay. <laughs> so then the government gives them a gin trap. And a gin trap is pretty much like what you would picture a cartoon bear trap to look like. Do you guys have an explanation of what those look like? Like the... Yeah. It's like the big metal ones that have the teeth on them that like something steps on them and they clamp on their foot. It's like yeah. a clam, um, but dangerous. Like you yeah, can, and that's, it's one of those ones you get a lot of views if you if you're a YouTuber and you put it on your hand and like break. You sure, up. yeah, we should do yeah. that. Yeah, this one though we're was trying to grow five, our channel. <laughs> <laughs> this one isn't one you'd want to do it with. It was almost five feet long. the The teeth on it were three inches long, oh. and it required multiple men to set it. So it was a really big gin trap, and the leopard had killed a cow. So they decided to use this carcass for bait. And they laid the trap exactly where they had seen the leper's paw prints as it fed on this cow. And then they placed all these thorn bushes strategically so the leper would be forced to walk exactly where it had before. Mm. And then Mm. they retreat to a a place where they can watch this cow. And as they're waiting, they suddenly hear a bunch of roars. And Corbett shines his light in the area of the kill. And they could see a leopard that was caught in this gin trap. And it's rearing up and down. And it's caught and it can't get away. And they're like, great, we caught it finally. So Corbett raises his rifle to shoot the leopard, fires a shot and hits the chain that connects this trap to the ground. And no. it insane. <laughs> so the leopard now with the gin trap connected to its foot starts jumping through the field and running off. And they have to wait a few hours till it's a little bit lighter. They track it down and they find it and it's growling. It's really upset. And Corbett kills it. Shoots it mm. in the head oh. and kills it. And everyone starts celebrating. I was going to say, killer... like, how did, like that trap's going to kill it still. Yeah. So they start celebrating. Everyone's cheering. And Corbett's just staring at this leopard. It's a large male. It definitely had killed this cow. And it had tried to kill some people in the neighboring village. So there's really no reason for him to feel like this wasn't the right leopard. But there was something just kind of nagging at him that made him think, this isn't it. He's Jim. Uh, he's they, Jim Corbett. He's he the knows guy. You know? What he's about. Yeah. yeah. Mondays. Yeah. He hates Mondays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the creator of Garfield. Um, so they tie the leopard to sticks. They carry it into the village. Ibbotson is just like beside himself. He's so happy because Ibbotson's like a local government official, and there's a lot of pressure on him to kill this mm. leopard. So he's like, he this really is wants it. the leopard dead. <laughs> yeah, he's like the he's like the mayor in Jaws kind of. Yeah, but he's much like, more go likeable. back to work. We're good. Mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so Corbett doesn't join the celebration. He had seen this man eater before. Something made him think it wasn't this leopard. So Ibbots and his wife and all the people that came to see the dead leopard, they're sure that it's the man eater so much so that they're getting in arguments with Corbett and all he asked Corbett said, don't tell the government that they'd killed the leopard. Just don't tell them yet. And don't tell people to like relax on their precautions yet. And the next night Corbett's woken in his camp by messengers from the nearby village. A woman had been killed a few miles away by the leopard. And this nightmare is far from over. Mm. Uh... All right. So we're going to take a quick break. We're not going to do much biology today, but we are going to talk a little bit about man eaters and kind of some of the science behind man eaters. Did uh, you guys see just... I was right about that song? Yeah. Jeez, the Nelly Furtado man. one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't think you were I don't right. Blame we us just based we were on wrong. your clues. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you didn't have a name or anything to attribute it to. <laughs> so I'm I'm going to say it was a draw. Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. So we talked a little bit about this already, but leopards are one of the few animals that have the potential to start specializing in humans. And although there's generally extenuating circumstances that lead them to kill and start feeding on humans, they can do this. So this happened throughout history. Leopards are thought to have been one of the few primary predators for early man, which we mentioned. And as we developed better and better shelter, better and better technology, we kind of removed ourselves from their menu. Mm. Um, But there are times, like from time to time, there are still leopards to become human specialists, and they can do a lot of damage when they do. So the Pinar leopard is one we brought up already. It was one of the ones that Jim Corbett had hunted before this leopard. It's considered to be the second most prolific man-eater after the Champawat tiger, and it's thought to have killed over 400 people in India before Holy it was finally killed cow. by our guy. Yeah, That's so crazy. It's a lot of people. This um, A single leopard? A single leopard. And it was so bold that it was I couldn't even, even eat to- like one person, I don't think. <laughs> oh, if you, dude, if you were in the right situation. <laughs> and it wasn't, do, it wasn't it. eaten like all of them. Is just eating like the vitals and stuff, I think. Right. Like some of the people that they kill, even like this, this Ruder Prayag leopard, it's just eating the parts at once and then leaving the rest of the carcass. Like you um, could kill 400 people, Mike, and just yeah. eat like a little bit. Yeah. No, maybe just no question eat, like, about that. <laughs> pinky finger. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> this leopard, the Pinar leopard, was so bold that it was even recorded to play the game of tug of war. With a man when it grabbed his wife by the neck and he grabbed her arm. Oh, wow. So the two oh. were just like pulling on this poor woman and the leopard finally let her go, but she died later. Some other notable man eating leopards are the leopard of the central provinces, which killed about 150 people in India, the leopard of Guma Lumpur, which killed about 40 ish people, the leopard of the Golis Range in Africa, northern Somalia, killed about 100 people. And then there's a bunch of other ones that you can read about. There's a whole Wikipedia page dedicated to them. Leopards can be pretty prolific man eaters, though. They're they're yeah, very capable. I had no idea. Of it. Well, I kind of had an idea, but I didn't know the extent. Yeah, yeah. After part so one, is... I would have been shocked had you had no idea. <laughs> yeah, would have been <laughs> surreal. <laughs> I've never heard of this. <laughs> this is kind of a crazy stat. Between 1875 and 1912. The British colonial government in India attributed about 12,000 human deaths to leopards. No way. So that's like a 30, what is that? 37 year period, 12,000 deaths to human or human deaths to leopards, which seems crazy. But then when you think about it, if one leopard can kill 400 people that like that could be possible. Yeah. And we didn't have like as good of like things to protect ourselves. Exactly. Especially so in, in some parts, areas. In some parts of India, leopards are still responsible for more human deaths than all of the large carnivores combined. So that includes bears, tigers, wolves. That's largely due to their tolerance to human presence and their ability to survive in shoulder habitat near human civilizations. So really, like, of the big cats, there's two species that can live in a pretty urban environment, and that's leopards and mountain lions. Both mm-hmm. of them can do pretty well like right on the fringes of even really big cities like Los Angeles or Mumbai. So there's a lot of hypotheses out there for why leopards and other large cats will start feeding on humans. Um, There's a study done on the skulls of man-eating lions, which included the Savo man-eaters, and they found that about 40% of those skulls had significant dental issues. I think we talked about that pretty extensively in the Savo episode, but they would see that they had like big canine problems or, you know, dental problems that would maybe cause them to switch to easier prey. I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here now, though. I'm going to say my personal opinion, which isn't totally based on everything that we've learned, but it is based on research and a lot of the experts that are a lot smarter than me when it comes to this stuff. So, I think it's a combination of factors that leads to cats initiating this kind of man-eating behavior. I think it can be everything from depleted prey, bad habitat, diseases, injuries, or dental problems. But I kind of just think it's like a cat 
that decides to specialize in people. Like, I don't really think there needs to be an extenuating circumstance. I think sometimes it's just a cat that's like, you know what, I'm going to try eating this thing. It's, it figures out that it's easy and then it just keeps doing it. And like, I think the evidence for that is like this leopard or the lions of Savo could have easily specialized in cattle or goats or some other easy prey, but they decided to go for humans and the leopard even turned down like goats to go after humans. So for me, it just kind of makes sense that some of these cats just decide this is what I want to eat. It's what I'm going to eat. Yeah. That's why I'm more of a cat guy than a dog guy. Yeah. 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 You like their independent you like, spirit. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> you got, you got to really earn their love, you know? Or else they'll yeah. kill you. So the other thing I when wanted you, to bring when up. When you that, said that you were going out on a limb on that one, yeah. I pictured you like a leopard out on the limb of a tree. Yeah. You or a Corvette. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hiding in his tree. So my one last thing that I kind of think is a bit of opinion, I didn't read this in any of the research, but someone's probably talked about this. I think the reason we don't see a lot more of this, the reason we're not seeing a lot more big cats that become man-eaters is because we actively select against it. So when a leopard or a lion or a tiger starts switching to humans and learning how to best hunt and kill humans, they don't live very long because we will hunt down and kill that animal. So whatever combination of genes and behaviors and whatnot led to that animal deciding to hunt humans is removed from the population and aren't bred into the next generation. So I think if we allowed this behavior to continue over and over and over again, you have leopards that are teaching their cubs how to hunt humans. They're passing on those genes and it becomes a much more common kind of specialization, but we actively select against it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect sense. Okay. It's like we right. shouldn't have let Ted Bundy have a kid when he is in jail for murdering a hundred people, but we did. Yeah, we should <laughs> probably. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there is some truth to that though. Like we talked about that in Yellowstone with problem bears. Like when you remove those problem bears from a population, you're also removing the genes that kind of caused them to do that in the first place. And you do tend to get better behaved bears over time. And I think we've kind of done that. Cause they don't like cats. teach their kid. They like teach their cubs, be afraid of humans and stuff like that. Right. And the large percentage of these man eaters are males but there's still genes that have caused them to be that bold to decide to check out humans as prey. And those are genes that they potentially would have passed to offspring. So I do think that's a big reason this doesn't happen a lot more than it does. But there's probably a big cat biologist out there right now shaking their head. SMH in. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There's a lot of things in life we just can't control, like maybe a leopard breaking down your door and pulling you out in the middle of the night. But there are a few really important things that we can control, like our nutrition. And taking care of your health can be a little difficult sometimes, but I'm really happy that I have AG1 in my life to help me make it much more simple. I've been taking AG1 for almost two years now, and having that morning routine of drinking AG1, one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, makes me feel energized, alert, more focused, nourished, and just ready for the day. And that's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a really powerful, healthy habit. It's also really simple. And for me, that's a big part of what is so important about AG1 is how simple it is. I can get up, I put some AG1 in my shaker, I shake it up, I drink it, and I instantly know that I'm starting my day off right. And I do feel like that energy is more long-lasting. It's not as temporary as the energy you might get from a, like an energy drink or coffee. So I really do just love the morning ritual of taking something that really starts my day off right. So if there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. And that's why we've partnered with them for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com backslash tooth. That's drinkag1.com backslash tooth. Check it out. Okay, so that's it. We're, we're going to go back to our story because we have a lot to get through still. We're about halfway there. But as we had just mentioned, this leopard had killed a girl. 
and the hunters knew that they hadn't gotten the right animal. Corbett had killed that other leopard, but now another person's dead and he knows we didn't get the right one. Yeah. So they went to inspect the body of the girl that the leopard killed and that put a quick end to their celebrations. When they saw the body, she was lying face down. All of her clothing had been removed and she'd been licked head to toe by the leopard because her skin was raw and bleeding. Leopards mm. have mm. that same yeah. lion tongue. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Can't trust a word this leopard says. She had four large puncture marks in her neck and the leopard had eaten a few pounds of flesh from her body and then left the rest. Mm. So they slowly pieced together what had happened. She lived in a small one room house with her husband and a six month old child. The husband had to leave for a bit, so his dad was staying in the house with his wife and their new baby. They'd just finished dinner, and she went outside to relieve herself and never came back. A few minutes later, the father-in-law got pretty nervous, so he called outside, and then when he didn't get a response, he got up and locked the door. The leopard had been waiting behind a large rock near the house, and when the girl squatted down, it snuck forward and pounced, grabbed her by the neck, and killed her quickly by severing the vertebrae between her head and her body. Hmm. Corbett had been right, and this man-eating leopard was still at large. I so, hate this leopard. I can't <laughs> say that. I, you know how, just like, wait, there's, yeah. I disapprove of, times, of what it's choosing to do. People will, like, poop when they die? Yeah. Well, if you just poop, do you think you poop again? I probably could. I could probably work out another poop. <laughs> yeah, I think for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. A good question, that's interesting. I'll have to look into that. Maybe this leopard didn't like eating people covered in poop, so it'd wait until it'd wait. they just pooped it's and smart. then it would kill them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do like when, as I read through this book, I did kind of think part of this leopard's strategy was just waiting outside of people's houses at night because it knew that people would come out to go to the bathroom. Most of these people didn't have bathrooms in their homes. Yeah, so it would it just would wait and wait sometimes for a few nights until someone would finally come out at night and then it would grab them. So it was very smart. It had learned our behaviors and it knew how to predict them. They should have just did what Jeff did, establish a pee corner and just, you don't even have to leave your room. Just pee right in your (laughs) your carpet. 14. Yeah. Yeah. 14 is crazy to be doing that. (laughs) It's bad. When I I first heard that story, I was like, what were you like six? (laughs) Nope. No, you were 14. (laughs) You were peeing in the corner multiple times. A lot. Until you haven't heard this. Like we have a broken (laughs) drain in the house. I was like, dad, I got to tell you something. (laughs) (laughs) I do think you've told that before, but I didn't realize. I thought it was like one time. I didn't realize. I think I was like like 12. Okay. But yeah, it's too, too old. old yeah. yeah. Because like I just couldn't sleep and I was peeing like every five minutes yeah. and I don't know what was going on. Way to be honest. I think I would have just stopped but <laughs> never told anyone. <laughs> yeah. Dad was not. That's so funny. He was, you know, he, wasn't he put thrilled. up with like my bad grades and, you know, kept quiet. But for that one, he had to kind of be like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame him. <laughs> All right, so Corbett and Ibbotson had a really terrifying night where the leopard ended up hunting them, gave them both a really bad scare. He had another really frustrating experience where he found a cow that the leopard had killed, once again put the gin trap in like the perfect spot where it's obvious that the leopard had stood, and then covered it up so it looked like he hadn't even moved a single twig. It looked perfect. Yeah. And he's really proud of himself, but when he returned, the cow was gone. The entire area had been walked on, aside from where the trap was so neat. and he could he could see that the leopard had spread its legs and stood on the arms of the trap but never once stood on the trail oh wow yeah. that's amazing so he starts say, feeling oh, go it's ahead. like kind of funny just like thinking like in and out if there's a long line i'm just like oh this sucks like i have to wait to eat and this leopard just waits like five hours outside of someone's house for them to go to the bathroom and that's like yeah they don't mind you know super patient yeah and then they just eat till they're completely full and they can go a few more days but yeah so he's feeling really dejected and he's saying that he feels inferior to this leopard Mm. so he decides he needs to get a refresh so he goes home and he's just like i'm gonna regroup and then i'm gonna return as soon as i'm able to this leopard had really just one round one with Corbett. <laughs> uh, 
So he's gone three months, and during those months, 10 more people are killed. Oh, wow. One of the worst stories was a woman that had been grabbed in her house by the leopard, and it's dragging her out of the house by her leg. And as she's being dragged out, this is one of the few people that was able to fight back. She grabs this long cutting tool that they use to cut grass, and she hits the leopard with it. And it causes it to back off a little, but it's still holding her leg. But it backed off enough to where there was a dividing door that she shut. So just her leg was like sticking through the door and she could kind of hold it closed and the leopard couldn't get at her whole body. And she was doing that and the leopard kept trying to pull her through and it couldn't. And finally the leopard got so angry that it ripped her leg off of her body. Oh, And God. ran off with her leg. And she died from bleeding to death. All right, so I think it's a good thought experiment, though, to think about this, to really think, like, put yourself in these people's shoes. You live in a little one-room house that your door is just, like, protected by a little wooden latch or something, and people, your neighbors are having their legs ripped off in their houses by this leopard. There's villages where literally every single door and window had scratch marks from this leopard trying to get inside. Every single person had had close calls with this leopard almost in some places. That's unreal. So you can't, I mean, I was sitting in my room last night doing research thinking, how would I feel if just at any minute a leopard could bust through the door and drag me out in the night and kill me? Like you would just always be on edge. So I I really don't blame them for being as terrified as they were. That's why I have a rifle. In case a leopard busts in. <laughs> Got him yeah. at the zoo. The zoo's not too far away. Mm. Yeah. There's going to be like some gun <laughs> nuts. You are a gun guy, so you can tell me yeah. if this is true. We're yeah, going to have I, some gun nuts after this episode. They're going to be like, I think See? I got a red. That's why. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> I don't even know what my gun is. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So a couple more stories about the leopard and the hunt for the leopard. One time they bought a goat that happened to be an extremely loud and vocal goat and they tied it up near the forest edge, Corbett Mm. and Ibitz. T-Rex style. Yeah. The goat's calling and calling and suddenly it stops and just stares into the woods in one spot. So Corbett whispers to Ibitzen. Ibitzen has a really good scope on his rifle. He says, look for it, it's there. Ibitzen can't find it. Then Corbett looks through his binos, he can't find it. But the goat's just staring at one spot. Finally, the light fades enough that they like have to give up. So they go and free this goat and it runs up the trail from them. And it had been really loud and it was a really good goat. So they didn't want to lose this goat. So they chase after it. (laughs) And the goat's kind of zigging and zagging up this trail. And it goes around a bend where they can't see it. So they run up to grab it and it's gone. And they look up on the hillside and they can't find it. And they're like maybe looking for 20 seconds. And they turn around and they start walking back on the trail and they see something white on the trail and Corbett runs up and it's the goat. It's dead. It has puncture marks in its throat and it's been laid across the trail. And he says it's a steep trail and it had been laid in the only way that it could be laid to where it wouldn't roll down the trail. And he imagined it was like the leopard saying here, if you want your goat so badly, take it. And it's now dark and you have a long way to go. We will see which of you will live to reach the village. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, man. he's got a so they regroup luckily, again after that one. This he yeah, leopards he win his mental game. <laughs> yeah. Three months is crazy. Yeah. Three more months. <laughs> you guys yeah. can just die for three months. <laughs> he touched the goat and it was still warm and its muscles were still twitching. That's how like recently it had been killed. Dude. Um, they had a box of matches that they were lighting the whole way to get back to the village, but they were pretty scared on the way back. Not long after the leopard kills another man and Corbett and Ibitzen poison the carcass with cyanide and the leopard ate a huge dose of the poison but still didn't die. Mm. There's an incident where Corbett started to buy into the idea that the leopard might be something more than just a regular animal, something supernatural. And it's a pretty crazy one. So this is like, of all the stories that I read of the ways that the leopard evaded them, this one was just crazy to me. So the leopard had grabbed a 70-year-old woman as she was closing the door to her house and dragged her through the street of her village. And she's screaming and trying to push away its face. And everyone's closing their doors because they no one wants to mess with this leopard at this point. Drags her through the village, kills her, and leaves her up against this rose bush. So the next day when Corbett and Ibbotson follow the blood trail... 
they find the naked body of the 70 year old woman and she's covered in all these white rose petals. And they said it was really grim and like looked like something out of a Gothic opera or something. It was especially offensive to them because it was this old woman who had, you know, been pulled out of her home and they decide to use the body as a lure and they're going to just really booby trap this scene. So they set up two of those rifle booby traps and Ibbotson's Uh. rifle has a hair trigger. Like if the slightest thing hits this trigger, it fires. (laughs) So they put like very carefully this thread on it and then they they tie the lines to the body. So they're thinking like the leopard comes in. If it moves this body at all in the wrong direction, it'll get shot. Then they poison her corpse. They put tons of cyanide all through her corpse. The only places they really don't put it are the head and the neck. And then they also put a big gin trap in a flat spot in front of the body. And then they spend all these time, like this time planting thorn brushes in all these places. So the leopard has to come in from the direction where there's all these booby traps, the gin trap, everything. Yeah. So they're like, Corbett says a rat couldn't get to this body without getting killed. Like, <laughs> they're trying three different to ways. Kevin McAllister it. They are. Yeah. So then they go to a nearby tree and they're also hoping for a shot at the leopard while it's approaching. They don't get their shot because it gets dark, but they're still hopeful that this leopard's going to get killed by all these booby traps. The hot iron falling on its face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Broken Christmas ornaments. Uh, so it starts to rain and Corbett gets really worried. He tells Ibbotson he's worried that the weight of the water on these lines is going to cause this hair trigger to go off or this trigger on the gin trap is really delicate. So he's worried the increased weight on the trigger might cause it to go off. And Ibbotson gets kind of pissed at him because he's like, you're a rotten pessimist. I can't believe you're like telling me that the water is going to cause this stuff to go off. Mm. And Corbett's like, I kind of deserved it, to be honest. Like he's like, this leopard was really in my dome at this point. Sure. So they're whispering to each other and suddenly roars erupt from the jungle. They knew that this gin trap had grabbed the leopard and they Mm. get really excited. And then suddenly it gets quiet. And again, Corbett's worried that maybe something hadn't worked and the, the trap had just been set off. And Ibbotson's like, no, we got him quit being so negative but as they approach the area with the body and the traps ibitson also starts to get a little worried by how quiet it is they get a surge of hope when they see that there's a big hole in the ground where the gin trap used to be where they had buried it so the gin trap had definitely gone off but then their hopes crash down when they see the gin trap laying about 10 feet away with its jaws closed shut and no leopard in the gin trap oh So they go back to the tree to sleep and they wait for daylight to inspect the scene and see what went wrong. And what they found was that the leopard had uprooted the thorn bushes that they had placed around the woman. It had dug them up and moved them. It had dragged the body of this woman toward the rifles. So it put slack in the lines Uh. Uh, instead of pulling them taut so they'd go off. It dragged them toward the rifles. It then ate the body around the lines that they had tied on the body. So it never, it ate like literally the lines were left untouched, but it ate all over the other body and it avoided all the places where they'd put the cyanide. So it ate the face, the neck, and then ate literally around the cyanide capsules that they had placed in this woman's body. And then the craziest thing is Corbett thinks that the leopard as it was leaving, did I say lion earlier? I might've. Sorry if I said lion or maybe I'm just saying lion and I'm getting confused. Anyway, Mm -hmm. it's been a long night as the leopard was leaving the area and stepping over the trap. Corbett thinks it might have gone off from either the leopard brushing it or the weight of the rain and it closed on the leg of the leopard. But the crazy thing is a few days ago, some of his men had dropped this trap and one of the teeth on this trap broke off and that's where the leopard got caught. So there was a gap in the teeth and that's where it caught his leg oh, and it wow. was able to escape because that's where it pinched it. And they knew that was true because it left a little bit of hair and tissue right in that gap. Jeez. So Corbett's like, he's SMH in, you know, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> this leopard has got my number. And yeah. he, he really is starting, when he talked about this, he's like, I wouldn't tell this story, but there was other people there and they witnessed it too. And it's just like almost too unreal to believe. Tooth and Claw is brought to you by Rocket Money. 
for me, Rocket Money was huge. It saved me a lot of money, which was monthly bills. So that adds up really fast. And I've also spoken with listeners, as I've said in the past, that have also reached out to me and told me, like, they were so surprised how much money Rocket Money saved them. It's really easy to sign up. And, I mean, you can just sign up and get rid of all your subscriptions super easily. So do it right now. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills all in one place. With over 5 million users and counting, Rocket Money has helped save its customers on average $720 a year and $1 billion in total savings so far. So it sounds like Mike needs it. Uh, That way you can pay me back. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash claw, all caps on claw. That's rocketmoney.com slash claw, rocketmoney.com slash claw. So the leopard made what would be its last human kill on the 14th of April, 1926. A widow and her two children, a 12-year-old boy and a 9-year-old girl, were walking up some steps on the side of their house with a neighbor boy. The neighbor boy looked through the window on the first floor and saw an animal lying on the floor of the open room, which he mistook for a dog, so he didn't tell anyone that he had seen something. Mm. All four of the group were carrying brass vessels for water that they had collected from the spring, and the 12-year-old son of this widow was in the back of the line as they walked up these stairs. Suddenly, the widow hears his brass vessel clang to the ground, and she turns around to yell at him, and he's completely gone. She walks to the bottom of the stairs, she picks up this vessel, she looks around, and she's thinking that he had dropped it and then gotten really scared that she was going to get mad, so he just ran into the bottom floor of one of these houses. Mm. So she starts looking for him and yelling for him, not really worried yet, and then a neighbor comes out, lights a lantern because it's starting to get dark, and holds it by the ground, and they see some big splashes of blood. So she starts to get pretty worried. Then they follow these blood splashes and they see the tracks of the leopard and she absolutely loses it and starts screaming and wailing in grief. The next morning, Corbett and Ibbotson show up and they track down the body. So Corbett knows the leopard's operating in this area. He stakes the boy's body down and he heaps up some straw for a little, sh- a little shooting platform and he waits for the leopard in the pitch dark. So I'm going to read you guys a quick section from this little hunt of his that I found very interesting. The straw that had been provided for me was as dry as tinder, and my ears, straining into the black darkness, first heard the sound when it was level with my feet. Something was creeping, very stealthily creeping, over the straw on which I was lying. I was wearing an article of clothing called shorts, which left my legs bare in the region of my knees. I'm familiar with those. (laughs) Presently, against this bare skin, I felt the hairy coat of an animal brushing. It could only be the man-eater, creeping up until he could lean over and get a grip on my throat. A little pressure now on my left shoulder to get a foothold, and then just as I was about to press the trigger of the rifle to cause a diversion, a small animal jumped down between my arms and my chest. It was a little kitten soaking wet that had been caught out in the storm, and finding every door shut had come to me for warmth and protection. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, so he spends the rest of this night staked out with this kitten. And as they're waiting, they actually hear the leopard start feeding on the boy. And then another leopard comes in and they fight. And Corbett's just like, oh, kill it. Kill this leopard. Mm. He's hoping that this other maybe male dominant leopard will kill it. And the next morning he gets up, he inspects, and there's no dead leopard the boy's been eaten, but he does find the tracks of the leopard, the man-eating leopard, running back toward Ruder Prayag village, which is where he's heading as well. He's not very good at like shooting in the dark, is he? He's not. He doesn't have. He doesn't. Have, he actually says that he's really good at seeing in the dark, which I believe because he's got crazy eyes. But he just there's no like ambient light a lot of sure, these nights, especially like- cloudy nights. There's not like electricity or anything. So it's really dark. But just seems like he like set up the hay or the straw or whatever <clears throat> by the yeah. body so he could shoot the leopard if it starts eating the body. And then yeah. it starts eating the body and he doesn't shoot. Yeah. Again, this isn't a massive animal though. And he wants to make sure that he gets it, you know, mm. 
because if he shoots at it every time it like comes up on a body, it's going to stop feeding on bodies that it's killed and it's going to give him less and less opera. It's going to get smarter. Yeah. You know? The more times he messes up, the smarter this leopard gets. But he's messed up quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so Ibitz and his friend had been traveling, but he joins Corbett and Rudra Prayag. And Corbett tells him he's doing one last Hail Mary. He knows that the leopard's been traveling the road between Golabrai, India, and Rudra Prayag at least every five days. And Corbett decides he's going to set up a hide in a mango tree along the road. And that he's going to wait 10 nights for this leopard. So for 10 nights in a row, he's going to go up in this mango tree and hope the leopard comes by. And he's going to stake a goat out as bait. If the leopard doesn't show in those 10 nights, or if he's not able to get a shot, the two men agree that they're going to give up. Ibbotson had been like putting off his job and stuff's piling up back in his hometown. And then Corbett was supposed to be in Africa like months ago, but he's been putting everything off to try and kill this leopard. And it had really, they knew that it had gotten their heads and they just thought maybe fresh eyes is what this thing needs. Like a new brain and fresh eyes because we're just like, this leopard is beating us at every turn. So this is going to be their last hurrah. Corbett sets up a hide near the house of a friend of his on the road, who was actually one of the only people that survived an encounter with the leopard. The guy had a lot of scars to prove it. And he starts his long wait. And each night he ties up a goat nearby and then he sits up in the tree all night. And then when it was light, two of his men would come and get him and then he'd go sleep during the day. So he does that for his 10 nights, no sign of the leopard. Mm. But in the meantime, it kills a goat and a sheep in the nearby village and tries to break into several people's homes. So the 10 nights That's pass illegal. and Corp. <laughs> yeah, you're not allowed to do that. Breaking and entering. Uh, <laughs> The 10 nights pass and Corbett returns to talk with Ibbotson and they both decide they're quitting. So they make their preparations to leave the next day. Each man is going to go home to their respective homes and go on with their lives. And they do. And the leopard kills 10,000 more people. And that's the end of the story. (laughs) I was going to say, if I were one of those villagers, I'd be pretty just devastated that like this guy came in. He's like, this is the guy. If there's one person that can handle this, it's Jim. And he's like, I quit. And you're just yeah, kind of yeah. left to your own devices. I, he, yeah. he is like the guy. <laughs> right. Like this is world famous too. At this point, this leopard is by far the most any animal's ever been reported on in international news. Like everyone knows about this. Oh. Hunt and they just yeah, can't, you can't kill it. quit. Yeah. yeah. And everywhere he goes, these people are still so hopeful. Like he is their savior. He is going to kill this leopard. Even at this point, people still believe in him so strongly. So he's, he's depressed. Like this is really getting to him. And one thing I really like about Corbett is sometimes when you read these accounts from these like great white hunter people, they're pretty racist and they're like kind of, they're so egotistical and like believe so much in their prowess as a hunter. Corbett's very humble and never once in this book did I read any really outright racism. Like, I think he really, he grew up in India. I think he loves the people of India. He saw them as like his people and he really felt terrible that he couldn't help these people with this marauding leopard. But so they decide they're going to quit, but he's got one more night in Rudra Prayag. He's like, my birthday's coming up. I want to go (laughs) see my friends. (laughs) Yeah. Also the mental tax of just knowing that this leopard could kill him too. Mm. Like he often imagined it coming and killing him. Well, yeah, he thought the kitten was the cat. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But he's got one more night and he says, what the hell? I'll go up in the mango tree this last night because I'm leaving tomorrow. I might as well. Mm. So around 9 p.m. he's in this tree. And he sees a man leave a pilgrim shelter nearby with the lamp. And the man walks to the edge of the forest to pee. And when he walks back, he puts out his lamp and immediately some dogs nearby start barking. And Corbett knows that these are dogs that are barking at a leopard. And that this leopard had seen the man come out and was probably stalking him and was going to go to the pilgrim shelter and try and pull someone out of the shelter. Then... The dogs turn in his direction and start barking right toward his tree. So now Corbett thinks, okay, this leopard's nearby. He's got his goat out there, and he's thinking this leopard's probably right at the bottom of the tree, and it's deciding whether or not it's going to go to the pilgrim shelter and pull another human out, or it's going to kill this goat. Mm. The dogs go quiet, and there's this long period of quiet, 
where he still is trying to figure out what the leopard's going to do. And he's thinking it's probably going to go to the shelter because the dogs don't start barking again. And he doesn't hear anything from the goat. It's only about 20 feet to where the goat is, but it's so dark that he can't see this white goat. So he closes his eyes to listen for any sound that might give away the position of the leopard. So he's holding his gun. He's got his eyes closed and he's got like a first generation flashlight strapped to his rifle. This flashlight hardly ever works. Mm -hmm. It's really fickle, but he's going to use it if he gets the chance. So he's sitting in total silence with his eyes closed for a while. He's wondering if the leopard had gone to get a human when suddenly he hears a rushing sound beneath him and the tinkle of the goat's bell. So he opens his eyes, he flicks on the flashlight, and as he flicks it on, he gets this brief glimpse of the shoulder of the leopard on top of the goat. And as he squeezes the trigger, the flashlight goes off. No. So the shot rings through the night, and he's sitting in total darkness, not knowing if he'd hit the leopard or not. He doesn't hear a sound. He doesn't hear it growling or yowling or anything like that. Huh. And he knows all I can do is wait. His friend in the nearby house hears the shot. He opens his door and starts yelling to Corbett, asking if he needs help. And Corbett doesn't answer because he's still just listening for any sound that he might have gotten this leopard. So he waits throughout the night. And when the first bit of light starts in the morning, he climbs down the tree and is greeted by a friendly bleat from the goat. So the goat's still alive. Oh. Just beyond the goat, there's a streak of blood that led down to the edge of the road and then into the jungle. It's a lot of blood. So Corbett knows that if he hit this leopard, if this is this leopard's blood, it's probably dead. So he decides to climb down on his own and investigate. 50 yards away, the leopard was dead in a small hole in the ground, its chin resting on the edge of the hole. Wow. All right. So Corbett had something to say about this dead leopard. And (laughs) hopefully it doesn't make me emotional because I actually thought it was like really beautiful what he said. And I'm going to read it to you guys. This leopard had been killing people for eight years. It had like done a total number on his mental health. He had every reason to view this as like a total monster. And this is what he wrote. No marks by which I could identify the dead animal were visible. Even so, I had never for one moment doubted that the leopard in the hole was the man eater. But here was no fiend who, while watching me through the long night hours, had rocked and rolled with silent fiendish laughter at my vain attempts to outwit him and licked his lips in anticipation of the time when, finding me off my guard for one brief moment, he would get the opportunity he was waiting for of burying his teeth in my throat. Here was only an old leopard, who differed from the others of his kind and that his muzzle was gray and his lips lacked whiskers, the best hated and the most feared animal in all of India, whose only crime not against the laws of nature, but against the laws of man, was that he had (coughs) shed human blood with no object of terrorizing man, but only in order that he might live. And who now, with his chin resting on the rim of the hole and his eyes half closed, was peacefully sleeping his long last sleep. Wow. (laughs) Which I really like. Like, he had every reason to call this leopard a monster and say, you know, I vanquished it and I've killed it. And all he said was, this was just a leopard that had figured out that it was going to eat people. It wasn't terrorizing people on purpose. It was just hunting. You know, that's what leopards do. This was its life. And it decided to, you know, switch prey species. And that's it. Like, that's what this was. And I love that Corbett in 1926 had that insight and that he wasn't like, I have killed this monster. He's like, no, I killed a leopard that was doing what leopards do. Yeah, that's a anyway, beautiful I, sentiment. Yeah. It really is. Ibbotson was much less <laughs> introspective about it. When they brought the leopard to Ibbotson, he cheered and ran up and hugged Corbett and was just like beside himself. Some of the other villagers that showed up put their hands up in the air and then fell to Corbett's feet and were like thanking him by like pretty much like falling at his feet. And they all got just very, very happy that they could finally relax, which I also don't blame them at all No, for that re- that reaction. So they measured the leopard. They found it to be healthy and they inspected it. They found it to be healthy aside from some wounds from its fight with the other leopard, a broken canine, some recessed gums, and a missing toe where it had been shot four years previous on the bridge oh, by those yeah. two British hunters. I forgot about that, the toe. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 
they took it to the nearby marketplace and they had kind of a viewing where people could come see it. And Corbett describes it as the most intense display of gratitude he had ever seen in his life. Wow. Like everyone had a story about this leopard, the people that it had taken from them, and they all just cried and were so happy. One funny last little anecdote is about the goat that he had that night. That goat became a local hero. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> people... People made this really fine, nice brass collar for it, and people would come visit it. And the owner of the goat actually, it became like a source of revenue for That's him. Awesome. That's awesome. So yeah. cool. Little Sebastian. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. crazy. So that's the, that was the oh, final night Cor- Corbett was planning on being there. Just, dude, it's so crazy. Fourth yeah. quarter buzzer beater to win it all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and honestly, like from reading his book, I don't get the impression that he was one to really tell tall tales. I really think it's pretty factual. And I do think that was actually his plan. Like, I'm not, I don't think he wrote that because it, makes sense you know like a better story yeah i think he actually was going to leave the next day and he just managed to kill it the last night that's like a robert ori buzzer beater though because it's (laughs) like it's not like kobe or steph where he's making shots throughout the game it's just the whole game he made one shot at the very end (laughs) big shot bob yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah, pretty crazy all right so that's the story of the leopard of rudra prayag pretty crazy you guys got any questions about it how so wait what was the total this one leopard killed again officially 125 people corbett Mm. thinks it was much closer to 200 just because a lot of people weren't counted and then people that died as a result of their wounds weren't counted as victims either so okay yeah it's crazy it is it's wild but a really a really good story i do think if you have the patience to kind of read a book that's not written with a ton of prose. His book is really interesting. I really did enjoy it. Why do you think they haven't made a movie about this? Uh, I don't know. It was actually something I thought about quite a bit. I know there's a BBC series where they did an episode dedicated to it that was like a reenactment, but they just kind of went off the rails and it was very fictitious. I think someone could follow this book pretty much to the letter and make a really interesting movie or or like five part series. If anyone has like a connection to Hollywood, let us know. (laughs) Wes could definitely help with a leopard movie. I was going to say, maybe they just can't find a guy that's cool enough to play Jim Corbett. But maybe we just have Wes do it. Just get Wes in that lead. I'll wear shorts. Yeah. I'll wear with your little khaki <laughs> shorts. I don't know if they were khaki, but they had to have been, right? Probably. It's not like he was wearing jorts, right? I'm really glad we did this because I think I had this preconceived notion of who Jim Corbett was. And I did see him as like the great white hunter kind of boisterous colonizer guy that came in there and, and just like pretended to be the best person to ever live. And that's not at all who he was. From what I gather from his book is he was really kind and really cared about wildlife and so much so that he stopped hunting and started photographing wildlife and there's national parks named after Mm -hmm. him. Yeah. Stopped shooting bullets and started shooting pics. Yeah. That's a good, exactly (laughs) good arc. Well, and like part of it too, I think just especially in that time period is like people from England or like people from like those areas they're the ones who had guns and knew how to use guns. And that's just like, and they just had more ways to efficiently hunt, you know? Yeah. There were like 4,000 Indian nationals that had guns in, in Garhwal though too. So I do like, I Mm. think, I think what you're saying is like, they had, they had the privilege of being brought up in places where they had the time to like go out and be trained how to hunt. Yeah. You know, and a lot of like efficient weapons. Right. I, I do agree with you in that. Um, but the advanced warfare tactic of tying a string to a gun. That's something only the yeah. English were doing <laughs> back then. If we ever go to Using India thorn together. thorn bushes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if we ever go to India together, I do want to go to Jim Corbett National Park. It's a great place to see tigers. Sure. So it yeah, would be, be fun great. to go. All right. All right. I'll Indiana is where that all took place? No, India. Did I say Indiana? <laughs> oh. I've been confused yeah, this whole time. I put a lot of a lot oh, of that makes a lot more sense. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They should be the Indianapolis Leopards instead of Colts for sure because of this. This is one of the one of that guy's <laughs> leopards that got loose in Ohio. All right. Um, okay. Let's move on to uh, our category. So it's going to be an interesting category week this week. We did most of our leopard ones last week. For the sake of not being too repetitive, we're going to get into our March Madness tournament a little what? early. Uh, All right. Yes. Who's doing that? You are, Jeff. What? Member? Let me just minimize this. So I did a smash bet to decide the order, and it went Wes, then Mike, and then me. And we're going to do its characters. Do you remember? I was young Link. Um, Uh, That's a bad one. You don't want that one. You you were villager, Mike. (laughs) And Wes was Yoshi. Okay. A Yoshi win. Yeah. Wow. Blue Yoshi. All right. Okay. So um, I got rocked, too. I lost so (laughs) fast. (laughs) Yeah. So this is how I'm going to do... We're going to... This is just a taste. The the subscribers are going to get the whole meal, right? Yeah. Right. So we're going to do... The amount of the body that Mike could eat (laughs) of the 400 people. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to do a little bit of the land mammal and creepy crawler section. We're saving water and air for subscribers. But how it's going to work, it's a 200-pound deathmatch tournament. And like the arena is going to be Hunger Games style where there's like a lot of different elements. Probably no weapons, though. But like, you know, just like water and trees and like a big cage is kind of what I'm saying. Um, and when you say 200 pounds, you mean every single one of these animals weighs exactly would, 200 yeah. pounds. Right. It's the size they would be if they were 200 pounds. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of just it. like the purpose of the that is equalizer. seeing what animal would be the most efficient kill- killer if they all weighed the same. Right. Like a cool. spider would be increased to 200 pounds and a blue whale would be decreased to 200 pounds. Yeah, exactly. Even out the and, field. If you don't like the thought of like animals killing each other, just think of it as like a holographic thing or something. I don't know. Yeah. Use your yeah, imagination. This is, this <laughs> is friendly competition. <laughs> they don't kill each other. They just <laughs> to submission. Yeah. Dominate. It, um all right. So, and they last rule, other. we're going to take turns choosing the winner, but if the two people not choosing agree to disagree with what the person chose, then that's yeah. what sticks. Yeah. So okay. Um, Me and Mike before this decided that we will always agree. <laughs> so just so yeah. you know. oh perfect. So I'll just choose the one I actually don't want. There you go. <laughs> um, the all reverse right. So collusion. let's enough talking. Enough rules. Who cares about rules? First rule Not of us. Fight Club is there is no rules. That's Calvin Ball. But uh, Wes, let's get this yeah. thing started in the land mammal round one. Wolverine versus a polar bear. We've already heard you say a wolverine killed a full-grown polar bear. (laughs) But then we're like, that's probably a lie. But anyways, 200-pound wolverine versus a 200-pound polar bear. Who you taking? I'm going to take the wolverine. Okay. I think just their, their reputation being so ferocious and so energetic and bold, I think that it wins this fight with the polar bear i think also when you make a wolverine that big its claws are huge the polar bear's claws get smaller and everything so yeah i think i think the wolverine mm-hmm. has better tools and is going to beat the polar bear when they're and both 200 wolverines pounds. weigh like 20 to 55 pounds polar bears weigh females to males it's like 330 pounds to like over a thousand pounds so yeah males get up to 1500 pounds so it's a big reduction for the polar bear. and a Maybe you choose like the female the polar bear, like a sm- smaller female one so it doesn't lose too much of its stuff, but still. Yeah, but I mean, I it like doesn't matter, pick. right? That's the whole That's the whole thing is they're 200 pounds regardless. If it's the male or yeah. the male, right? Yeah. yeah. No arguments for me. No, I agree. Okay. Well, then um, moves on. Okay. Uh, Mike, you got coyote versus cheetah. Oh, uh, I'm going with... Cheetah. Oh, they what's just, your reasoning? They just seem a little more predisposed to dispatching prey to me. 
at least like bigger sized prey. Um, Coyotes weigh 15 to 46 pounds. Cheetahs weigh 46 to 160. So the coyote's getting a bigger boost. I still think the cheetah has a little more athleticism at its disposal, and that's what's going to put it over the top for me. Run in circles around it until it gets dizzy. Yeah, until it gets dizzy. dizzy. Right. (laughs) I agree with you. Coyotes don't really, they're like other dogs in that they're not necessarily like killing prey, like big prey with like a stranglehold. But a cheetah will. A cheetah will bite through the windpipe and kill something pretty quickly. So I think this is a pretty good fight until that cheetah gets the coyote's windpipe, and then I think it's over. And mm. the, the cheetah is a lot faster, too. I would have picked coyote, but that whole run in circles around him, I convinced myself <laughs> cheetah. So Good. Yeah. All right, so I got leopard, and then I'm specifying that it's a black panther. Okay, cool. Um, versus a North American striped skunk. So that skunk's right. going to put out some serious stink. But they don't really have that good of weapons compared to a panther. Panthers, you can get one up to like 160 pounds. So, I mean, just give them a little bit more boost. Like, it's got to be the panther here, right? Yeah. we. I mean, in our yeah. story, we had, that leopard was killing full-grown cows. Um, like was this, more than 200 pounds. You think their skunk yeah. smell could knock the leopard out? Uh, no, but like... <laughs> I have seen That's I've seen grizzly way. bears run away from skunks. Yeah. So I think initially this leopard is running from the skunk, but one of them has to win, right? Like that's the whole basis to this is like they're <laughs> not let out of Hunger Games until one of them kills each other. Right? Yeah. So I think if it comes down to it, the leopard is going to win. Here's leopard the skunk can't do is handstands. going to be twenty times bigger than what they are. So that's yeah. like twenty times skunk. more stank. Yeah, so sure. I'm going to say skunk knocks him out with the smell and then kills him. So I'm going skunk, actually. I'm, I'm, what on, you my, I'm on Wes's side. So Okay. <laughs> so it's you try it, Jeff. But, okay. Uh, yeah. I don't, I think, I don't That's think fair. it knocks I, it out. Yeah. I, I was <laughs> thinking leopard and then I convinced myself of the skunk. <laughs> you know what's a funny thing about the Corbett book is he didn't think leopards had a sense of smell. Which is pretty wild. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Huh, back then, they thought that they didn't really have a sense of smell. They do. Yeah, he could All have right. definitely used that to his advantage had he not thought mm-hmm. that way. Um, yeah. Wes, you got honey badger. Honey badgers. What don't they give Wes? A fuck. <laughs> You're right. Versus spider monkey. So honey badgers are like eleven to thirty-five pounds. So they're getting like you know, 15 to 20 times bigger. Spider monkeys yeah. are only four pounds, so they're getting like 40 times bigger. Yeah. Yeah, that puts the spider monkey the size of like a small gorilla. Yeah. Um, but then the honey badger is also that big. That, that would make the honey badger look like a small grizzly bear. So I, the spider monkey one. has, yeah, this is a good one. The spider monkey has really great agility it's smarter. The honey badger has better weapons and better protection. They're really well protected animals. They're hard to kill. They're more and used actually, to like combat than a spider. They monkey. are. They are really smart too. I just watched this video on how this guy who had a captive honey badger simply could not come up with an enclosure that could keep this honey badger in. It would like pile rocks on the wall to climb out, or it would like stack logs to get out. It was so smart. So I I think I'm I'm sticking with my mustelids and I'm giving the honey badger a slight edge. I'm saying that it is also winning. It's similar to the Wolverine, just really tough, hard to kill animal. I think the spider monkey's trying and trying and trying and getting really creative. But after a long battle, the honey badger's still going to win. Yeah, no, I like that one. And then we got a good like round two matchup of like, Two similar matches, I feel like. Wolverine versus Cheetah is kind of similar to Leopard versus Honey Badger. Okay, yeah. Is Spider um, Monkeys have long tails, right? Yeah. So maybe it could like tie its tail to the trigger of a gun? <laughs> <laughs> I do. No, no weapons not... in the cage. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like I'm like 52% honey badger, 48% spider monkey. I really, really think this one could go either. Yeah, wow. cuz yeah. spider monkeys are really smart 
and they're super agile. Well, and I feel like with like the Hunger Game landscape, they're going to be able to use like trees and sticks and stuff to their advantage a bit more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What movie is it? There's some kung fu like underground movie, like underground tournament where there's a guy that does like monkey kung fu uh, and he I goes up against blood someone. Sport. Kumite. Yeah, he goes up against just someone like huge. Yeah. I I think that's this fight. You got like a <laughs> brawler against some or someone that's super agile. Yeah, yeah. just like pick it, even like, though they're the same size. Okay. All right, Mike, we got a great matchup here for you. Let's go. Chimpanzee versus Jeff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so even at the best of times. We know I could beat like I weigh between one ninety to two ten. Do you so want to just take this I weigh one, Jeff? about 200. Because <laughs> I feel like it's the only way anyone's going to give you a shot. <laughs> well, let me just make my argument. Go and for then it. You right. Because you know it's how Wes pick. and I feel. Yeah. Because I weigh about 200 pounds. I could take a chimpanzee right now. They weigh like 130 most, uh-huh. you know? Okay. Sure. So, so, your voice. He could. <laughs> <laughs> so then, like, you boost their stats up to 200. That's a pretty good fight. So what do you think, it's Mike? It's not. <laughs> so as I was saying, even at the best of times, it's, uh, I mean, we're given the chimp a 99 out of a hundred of these fights, I feel, <laughs> Yeah. but what's like, what are, what are odds like Vegas odds? You're like negative what on this. No, he's like plus a million, <laughs> plus, right, plus 10,000. <laughs> the chimp wins. Yeah. Oh, shit. All right. I tried. Um, all right, so I got... <laughs> it's just going to wait for you to pee in the corner. No, Ooh, I got oh, a tough yeah. one. Indian gray off. mongoose versus spotted hyena. Wes, what do you think's a better predator, a mongoose or a hyena? A mongoose. Really? Predator. Hyenas are mostly scavengers. They got um, good jaws, though. Yeah, they got super strong jaws, but mongoose are really fast. Mongoose, um, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're... <laughs> I, I mean, for me, it's the the mongoose. Me too. Hmm. Those things are like facing, squaring up with snakes and winning. Cobras. Ricky well, I think Kabi. I'd take yeah. the hyena, but you guys both are going mongoose, so it's mongoose. So I got outvoted both of mine so far. Huh. Um, all no. right. No. Wes, African porcupine versus an African elephant. <sighs> the porcupine. Porcupine. Because yeah. it's... Elephant, like all it has for its weapons right now, like it's the best if it's right. No weight, it's no. But it yeah. just uses its weight, so it's right. not going to be able to do it. Much. All it has is its tusks. Maybe and it's, it's a little more agile with its tusks. I don't know. Porcupine, I'm not saying it's as clear cut. African crested porcupines weigh like twenty two to sixty six pounds, so it's getting a big boost too. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't think the the porcupine isn't an aggressive animal, but the elephant isn't really either. Well, the elephant's it. attacking it over and over again, and it's finally sus- it's succumbing to its multiple quill wounds. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going porcupine. All right, Mike. Siberian tiger versus Norway rat? Just a rat. Norway. Norway rat. Yeah, just a normal. Norway rat. Norway. Norway. Sorry. Norway rat. No way is this rat winning. I'm saying. Well, wait. What <laughs> makes what makes Norway rats special? Do we? That's is that's any... just the common rat. That's like the rat you see in like. Okay, just a so rat. It's, it's got like diseases. The yeah, yeah. It's like three pounds normally, so it's like it gets huge. fifty times bigger than what it normally would be. Siberian tiger. A small adult Siberian tiger is like two hundred thirty pounds or so. So like. Okay. If you grabbed one of them and just made it a touch smaller, you're still getting a pretty normal tiger, you know? Yeah, I think it's coded in behavior is... The big ones get 700 pounds. I'm giving it to the tiger just because I feel like it has a better strategy going into the fight than a rat would to take down something equally as large. Rat teeth would be huge, though. (laughs) It's true. They'd be all rabid. I think the tiger... The tiger kills prey that has really big teeth, too, and it like or like tusks or whatever, and they know how to stay away from them. So I, right. I agree. I, I kind of want to change my spider monkey. Can Ooh, I? Or is it, is too, it too late? late? Um, I think the spider monkey If wins, you make a good enough I argument. I think I was still thinking that the badger was built in a way where it wouldn't sustain the amount of damage. But if they're both 200 pounds, the spider monkey is going to have huge teeth. 
it's going to be really smart. I think it's chucking rocks at this badger. Yeah. I think it's like, I think it's going to kill it over time. I think it can like it's staying in the do trees. a lot of damage from like away from Above. it. You know? Right. Yeah. So sure. I think right, the spider monkey wins. Okay. Let's change it. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it's really agreed. bothering me. No, I like that. All right. So we got our round one of land mammals set in stone now, Wes. Okay. Okay. All right. So you know it's real hard. You can make changes in stone, but it's really hard. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. All right. Moses, so creepy the crawler. commandments were in stone, and that's lasted. <laughs> God did that. Like well, didn't he 6, break years. one of them because he got so pissed? 4,000 years. Just because people were having fun. Yeah. yeah. Dude, that dude was <laughs> such a buzzkill. Yeah. All right. Let's do creepy crawler round one, and then. Okay. Did um, you guys have a creepy crawler oven when you were kids, or was you guys too young for that? Oh, I yeah. never had one. My friend did. Creepy so crawlers. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> I had one. And you would just, for those of you who don't know, it was like, a, it was like a, the ovens that people sometimes buy for their kids that you could bake little things in. But instead of baking little treats, you would put this like disgusting gel into <laughs> these molds and bake little like spiders and stuff. Yeah. And it just smelled like the worst chemicals. <laughs> I it was so it. terrible. It was like but yeah, a, I made a lot of gross. A top crawls. five jealous moment at show and tell for Mike in elementary school when my friend yeah. brought it in. I don't I know if it was Mike. the most jealous I've ever been, but close. It's in the it's in the top five ever. Yeah. Gotta be the a fire Rushmore. hazard. In high school, one of my friends, there's a girl I always had a crush on who didn't like me at all. And then he found out I had a crush on her and just like dated her for two weeks. And I was pretty jealous of him. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You bring her to show and tell. Dick. Yeah. Just show me like, hey, just so you know, I am better than you. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> so don't forget. I never forgot. Um, all right. So Mike, you just picked. So it's my pick now, right? What did I pick? Yeah. Tiger versus rat. Yeah. 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 So creepy crawler. Round one, we got Black Widow versus Brown Recluse Spider. Um, the Brown Recluse is, they're both, I mean, all of these creepy crawlers are getting huge, right? Yeah. The Brown Recluse, is or Black one. Widow is getting a lot bigger, or like, I think it's size. Not really. I think it gets, well, yeah, I guess you're right. They're like the same size. Obviously. They're about the same but, size. Yeah, it's negligible. I'm if taking. They're both 200 pounds. I'm taking the Black Widow because brown recluses don't use webs, right? That's a good question. We haven't really gone into, but see, I was almost going to say the other, like brown recluses do run around a lot more like they're ground hunting spiders. I don't know if they have any webs or not, but I don't think they use webs to ensnare prey. Yeah. Um, Black Widows are to me, webbing up. The- that almost felt like an advantage to me though, that the brown recluse was like so much more mobile, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess that's like comes down to your technique that you think is more effective. Oh, shit. They Mike, both have really potent venom. Uh, are you going to side with breaker? Wes? I'm going with the Black Widow. Okay. Okay. I think I wanted the Brown Recluse to win because I think when it comes to fighting some of our other animals, it's yeah. much more interesting to think about a spider that moves on the ground than one that sits in webs. You know what I mean, though? It just throws like such an interest. Like the web thing is it kind of defeats the purpose it's like a it's like a superpower almost right But yeah that's fine you don't think any animals can get through the web if they're all 200 pounds i think a two spoiler here i think a 200 pound spider beats everything on our list (laughs) but i would much rather it be a like a running spider than a webbed spider but I'm, you know, I'm outvoted. So we're keeping the black. black we like conversation with the brown recluse going forward. Yeah. Mm. But also, I, I, I also agree black, with that. I like black the, widows okay. can move on the ground, but they're not as fast. Brown, as brown recluses recluse. will just have like gigantic tunnels in the ground and be like yeah. creeping around all over. I like, think it's I'm a better change contender. It. Let's do right. brown okay. recluse. Good. All right. Wes, you got fire ant versus bullet ant. Uh, I'm picking the bullet ant. Bigger jaws, stronger venom. I just think it's, well, the jaws, I think it's a clear. You think the jaws will still be bigger? Yeah, it still has bigger mandibles. Like if they're both upgraded to 200 pounds, like they're upgraded, their bodies like proportions stay the same, right? Mm, so right. like the fire ant has smaller sized jaws compared to the rest of its body than the bullet ant. Okay. So I'm picking, I'm picking the bullet ant. 
because yeah. it's got bigger mandibles. It, it can kill. And fire it has ants stronger venom. Can't actually like use fire, right? No, <laughs> no, they don't have fire power. Okay. I think bullet yeah, ants maybe have the name. The names there are pretty crazy. Fire and bullet. Yeah. Yeah. Bullet ants don't have bullet powers either. I'm just gonna make sure I'm I'm right about them having bullet no ants having fire bigger jaws. Ant. Yeah, no, that's not what I'm I know I'm right about that. Okay, yeah, I'm picking the bullet ant for sure. Okay. They have like pinchers too, right? And mouths. Can't they don't they have like two? That's what I'm their their mandibles are like their pincers. Yeah. Um that's their but that's their jaws. And then they have a mouth that that feeds into. Yeah. All right, we got 200 pound western diamondback rattlesnake versus spitting cobra. Mike? <laughs> cobra versus diamondback, huh? Spitting cobra. cobra. I, that makes so little difference to me who knows next to nothing about any of these. Um, well, a spitting cobra can I'm going literally with... spit its venom into the eyes of like an attacker. Right. Okay. And they both weigh like, I don't know, five 200 pounds, pounds or something. So now okay. they're huge. <laughs> They're just huge now. I'll go with this. Having a projectile attack is going to put it over the edge for me every time if one has a projectile and the other doesn't. So I'm going with the spitting cobra. Yeah. I In this matchup, I feel like the diamondback has like the faster strike and a better like strike still. Uh-huh. Yeah. But the spitting cobra does spit a ton, it's got shit the range. ton of venom now. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how much like venom from other species of snakes affect like other species like if if a cobra venom would like really do much to a rattlesnake but i think it would i think yeah. they're pretty much immune to their own venom but i think a cobra venom would affect it and vice versa so i like that pick Let's especially to an eyeball cobra. i think if you get it in an eyeball no matter whose it is yeah. it's gonna hurt plus a spitting cobra introduces a fun element into this whole thing so plus yeah. how is a snake gonna wipe venom out of their eyeballs you know they don't have hands it's a good point. They have to use their tail, point. but their tails That's are rattles. Annoying. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to be comfortable. Yeah. No, it's going to be noisy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So I got green anaconda versus eastern coral snake. Coral snakes are like super venomous, right? And they're tiny little guys. Yeah. They're small. They're rear fanged. So they really have to bite down to get their venom in. They're not like a striking snake where they have like the hypodermic needle injection. They have to like kind of work their venom in. Um, but they do have, they have a really potent neurotoxin. How fast does it work to kill something? Pretty fast. I mean, it's, it's neurotoxin. So it attacks the nervous system. It's like attacking. So I'm saying the green yeah. anaconda starts off like winning and starts like strangling this coral snake. Yeah. <laughs> But uh-huh. then the coral snake eventually gets a bite in and kills the anaconda. Yeah, I like that. I think two equally sized snakes, it's pretty hard for one of them to constrict the other one to death. I think that it would be pretty tricky for the anaconda to win. So I think it'd be I, I super like easy snake. since snakes are just basically one long neck. You can just strangle yeah. the whole thing, you know, kill it pretty easily. Yeah, I don't think you that's know what? True, but. Where does the, the neck snake. end and the tail begin? I think this is like one of the most obvious ones. But <laughs> I was just thinking okay. for the next matchup. Just playing it's, devil's advocate. All right. Um, well, for actually the easiest matchup, Wes, we got next uh-huh. Komodo Dragon versus the those really cool looking axle. Axolotls. Yeah. Oh, the cuties, the little pink <laughs> cuties. Yeah. The ones that look like they just disintegrate if you, you touched know, it. I got I just put them in because we haven't really ever talked about them and I wanted I wanted yeah. the picture, you know. You're yeah. right. This is the easiest matchup. It's definitely the Komodo dragon. Uh, yeah. Axolotls have like no protection or weapons <laughs> whatsoever. Except so. for their cuteness. They can do a little <laughs> They are very cute. Disarmingly cute. Right. Yeah. I don't um, think the Komodo dragon gives a shit. <laughs> no. Those rascals. Mike, you got yeah. a gecko versus scorpion. Oh, I put oh. in the type of gecko. Did you not want to use it? No. <laughs> Toke? What's the Toke gecko? It, they're kind of like known as being the meanest species of gecko. Mm. There's okay. lots of geckos. Okay. But yeah. They can regrow their tails, which is or something. Or a bark scorpion. 
So maybe the move would be they rip their own tail off and use oh, it as yeah, like a that's throwing a big weapon. Old tail. Yeah. And then the Those scorpion gets its tail like stuck in the gecko's lost right. tail. Yeah. It's like a little diversionary. They're tactic. smart enough for that. <laughs> Are we giving I them mean, like two hundred <laughs> advanced? Their brain is bigger now too, Wes. <laughs> 200 pound doesn't bark equate, scorpion <laughs> is pretty sweet though. Yeah, I think I'm giving it to the scorpion. Tail. Yeah, I like that. Those bark scorpions have some of the most potent venom of scorpions. Nice. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I like that. That'd scorpion. be a good round two matchup the Komodo versus the bark scorpion. There you, you go. got to think about it too. With all these venomous animals, like a tiny little bark scorpion that's the size of your pinky finger can put a person in the hospital with just like drops of venom that we probably couldn't even see so when it's 200 pounds it's pumping liters of that same venom into something right like probably enough to kill multiple blue whales like that's how much venom we're talking so all it has to do is get any of these venomous animals all they have to do is get their venom in and that thing's toast well especially if the blue whales weigh 200 pounds right oh, yeah <laughs> i'm talking normal blue whales <laughs> All right, we only got two left, people. So Hercules Beetle versus Dung Beetle, to me. I've seen a Ooh, video of Hercules video or Hercules Beetles just like yeeting other beetles off of stuff with their horns, just like yeah. flinging them, which is sweet. That's such a good move. Right. But man, this Dung Beetle is going to have such a big ball of dung. Just roll the beetle with like a... Because they roll be. their dung's are bigger than them and they're 200 pounds now so it's rolling like a 400 pound thing of dung over this hercules beetle like could probably use the like the stars to find the hercules beetle too (laughs) so i'm taking Uh, the dung beetle with this big old ball of dung i'm voting for the hercules beetle but i don't i actually you know what if they're both the exact same size yeah who knows you know, I, I know you love dung beetles, so let's leave the dung beetle. <laughs> yeah. I love both of them. They're both yeah. cool. Um, I like that. It's ball funny of dung because there. I kind of liked getting vetoed just because I like both animals, and I feel bad <laughs> like for the one that I chose. Getting losing. rid of one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't care right. at all that I got rid of the axolotl. <laughs> no. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> all right, Mike. This is a good one. Praying man, two hundred pound praying mantis versus a two hundred pound giant centipede. Oh, wait, this is to Wes, though, but it is a good one, Mike. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, I got to go with the centipede again because it's venomous, and so I think all it takes is, like, a bite, and the praying mantis is done. I like that. I think the praying mantis is, like, a more fun contender because of the way that it kills stuff, but I think if they're equally sized, praying mantis usually kill stuff that's smaller than them, and if this thing's just as big and it's venomous, I'm picking the centipede. I'm going to veto. I think the praying mantis decapitates the centipede before it dies of any venom. I was going to say. coming down to Mike. So what happens is the mantis seduces the centipede so they have sex. And yeah. you know what happens after sex, Wes, with mantises? <laughs> yeah. It veto, are you with me, Mike? Oh yeah, totally. All this right. one's going right. to mantis. mantis. That's yeah. fine. I actually, I'd rather have the mantis in because we already have a lot of venomous critters in there. So, you know, a yeah. mantis is like really easily getting seduced by, or a centipede's getting seduced by a mantis because praying mantises are just a lot prettier than centipedes. It's like this is my chance. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make this clear to like. It's Hunger Game rules, so like there is venom that they can use, but if the other animal kill like gets hit with venom that's going to kill him, but still kills the other animal first, then the Hunger Game rule people like save that. They come one. in and save. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, it's like not the, gonna it's not gonna die yeah, anymore. Yeah, didn't Peta eat the danger berries or whatever before the venom gets? Yeah, exactly. What were they called? I just want <laughs> some kind of berry. Oh, yeah, I don't remember <laughs> gooseberries. Goose. I do want to like. <laughs> I do want to stress again, any 200 pound venomous animal like this is pumping so much venom into you that probably just the extra liquid in your body would kill you instantly. 
So it's an instant death for any of these venomous <laughs> critters once they get that venom in you. Yeah, well, mm. that's just your opinion. Yeah, right. I think decapitation is <laughs> pretty instant. For yeah, yeah, I'm fine with the praying mantis, but I'm saying <laughs> I don't think any of our animals are getting bit and then dying a slow death from venom. If you get bit by the venom, you're dying. Okay. So Noted. that's that's our teaser. Uh, I hope that was entertaining. We're gonna we're gonna get more into it. Mike, you said you have like a real sleeper pick that you want to go a oh, long yeah. ways. It's going the distance. <laughs> I'm fighting tooth and nail for it. <laughs> All right, that's our podcast. Yep, tooth and nail. Um, that's that Christian punk record <laughs> label. Yeah, what, jars of clay or something. I don't know who was on that MXPX. label. PX. Yeah, Wes. What else? El- what else do we want to do before ending this episode? You know, I think we should just end it. I think let's do our um, claw ratings because we didn't do those for leopards. We got a fresh new batch of listener questions that we're going to get to in our next episodes. So we're excited to get to those. We got a bunch of patron questions to get to. But I think let's just go ahead and do our claw ratings and and wrap this baby up. So I mentioned this briefly. I kind of spoiled this in the last episode. This was my favorite animal for a long time, leopards. Uh, I think they're beautiful. I think they're one of the more like a luring of the cats. I think just the way how like stealthy they are, how beautiful they are. No big surprise here. It's a 10 claw animal for me. <laughs> what? No. Yeah. 10? It is. 10 claws. This is one I think is really hard for me because there's just so many cool big cats and I feel like it's kind of lame to just have them all ranked like the same, you know? Yeah, So I'm giving them all 10s. <laughs> I'm giving it a nine. I think that your story made me like them a lot more. Just like, I kind of feel like maybe I should like them more than jaguars because like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think they pose in cooler spots and trees. Yeah. Yeah, They can kill way more people. They seem just a little more badass than a jaguar. So I don't know though. It's on my radar. Killing caiman. Yeah. Okay. It's on my radar, but jaguars are still, I still like jaguars, cheetahs, lions, tigers more than leopards. So that's why I have to give it a nine. Okay. Mm. But overall, let's put them at 57. Hoping I see some in Africa and that number goes way up. All right. I'll also give them a nine. I don't have anything new to add to the conversation that hasn't been covered already. I just think they're an extremely charismatic and pretty animal and people should. Where do you have them ranked for cats? So like it's tiger, wild cats, tiger, cheetah, jag, leopard. Okay. Uh, so okay. forth. Right now in my current rankings, I think they'd probably be fourth for me too. I think I'd go tiger. No, sorry. Jaguar, mountain lion, tiger, leopard would mm. probably be it. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I like them all a lot. They're all 10 claws for me. I do have one listener question, actually. Okay. Mine and Jeff's mom, Cindy, who a lot of you have heard on this podcast. Hey, mom. Had a question that she really wanted me to ask. Okay. And it was, if if all three of us were in one of these rooms that we talked about in our stories and a leopard came in, who would get killed first and why? Hmm. I, w- I would s- say not me because I'm the worst sleeper. So I don't think I would be asleep yet. There was one story. The cook, when the je- when the leopard went in and, and like almost got the cook, but the tree cracked and it got away, the cook was snoring really loud. And that's why Corbett thought that it had like uh, targeted him. Yeah. So I will say like either of you it could be me. are a bigger target for that. You reason. snore too. Not, not nearly as much as you guys do. Mm, I'm like once every few days. Not as much, but you do. You are, I have the most to be eaten if it chooses me, which is tempting, but you're the easiest to carry out of the room. That's true. I would be very easy. And it does seem like it kind of went for like smaller people usually. Yeah. Yeah. It might be me. I'll go west. I think if we're, I think if we're laying on our backs, it's one of you two. If we're not, (laughs) then it's me. If we're snoring, cutting logs. Uh Uh-huh. Thanks, Maybe Mom, if I have a question. bloody nose and it smells the blood. Ooh. Or if you're up peeing in the corner. I do yeah. pee a lot in the night. It does yeah, wait for people to do that. Maybe it is me. I think any of us are pretty good victims. So bring it on, leopards. All right. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, for sticking with us through the story. I really liked it. I It's one of those ones that the more I researched it, the more I could only think about it. 
Mm. Like all I've been thinking about for the last few weeks is this story. So it's kind of bittersweet to be done with it. But um, we are going to we're going to be talking more Corbett at some point in this oh, podcast. Nice. So um, great. When we get to the Champawat Tiger or maybe some of his other exploits. It chomped so. a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Save that for that. Let's, awesome. shoot, Let's end it right there. <laughs> love All you right. guys. Bye guys. Love you. See ya. <laughs>